but before um, joining Michael at, at Trent, I was uh, a professional economist working at Treasury for a short period and a trade body called the Council of Mortgage Lenders that go by the name these days of UK Finance. So that's me. And now over to, to Michael. Oh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Michael McCann from Nottingham Trent University. As Dean alluded to there, said there, there we were colleagues for quite a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And we presented on numerous occasions in various forums <laughs> and doing various things. So I'm a, I'm a financial economist. And so I, I, I sort of apply financial concepts and ideas to financial markets and banking. And so I tend to sort of like the reason I'm interested in data and using data is to sort of think about how you can make sense of what's going on in financial markets, if anyone can, um, <laughs> using economics. <laughs> But that's the sort of sense that we have. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming along, joining this session. Um, I see some very interesting comments in the chat. Thank you very much for contributing to the chat and some of the ideas about thinking about data. Mm. Oh, I see someone is a finance lecturer and oh, yeah, some examples there, that I look at. Yeah. Oh, uh, Helen from Nottingham Trent. Is that your oh, colleague? Yeah. That's my boss. She's my boss now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, interesting. Uh, yeah, let's see, let's see some, yeah, so that, that, that sort of idea, you know, some people who are teaching econometrics and stats, where obviously data plays a big role in that teaching. But hopefully we'll, we'll get you thinking about how you can get out of those silos and think about how data has got a more widespread appeal in you know, making sense of the world around us using economics, but also you thinking more about how you can learn more about economics using data. Okay. So how how's today is going to um, pan out in terms of the workshop? Well, we're going to present some ideas and thoughts in the next few minutes about using or teaching economics using data. And feel free to use the meeting chat to pose any questions or comments you have as we go through our brief presentation. And then maybe we'll pick up some of those question and answers after we've finished that, that presentation. And then we'll, we'll give you a bit of time to sort of like chat with one another and share ideas about how you use data in teaching economics at the moment. And if you're looking at and, and then discussing how you might increase and extend the use of data in teaching economics. Yeah. That's the way which we're planning. Mm. Isn't that right, Dean? That's the right. Yeah. No, I think it's just a very interesting. I'm just looking at uh, people's profiles here, Michael. I think it's really interesting because one of the things that's motivating what Michael and I want to do this afternoon is to show how um, you can incorporate data beyond. Um, econometrics modules that's not to say that um, we we want to be um, sort of excluding those individuals far from it but I think a key message is that we want de um, students to to feel is the word comfortable Michael I think it's it's comfortable isn't it and handling working with data developing their their economics whether that be micro macro I, I see what well, we've got one or two individuals who are policy orientated I think yeah. I saw is it health up front? There was certainly a policy one. So mm. we, we want to show how <laughs> we can overcome, because I, I think, I don't know, maybe I should ask people to put this in the chat, whether they observe with their students something that Michael and I have observed over many years, which is often a phobia. We call it, don't we, a phobia or fear working with data. So part of what we want to talk about this afternoon is encouraging you to develop that sort of confidence that students have working with data in in better understanding economics and as we'll talk about in a moment sort mm. of aligning with the sort of work that professional economists do yeah okay. so i see julie <laughs> yeah. sort of someone's agreed with does. the word yeah. phobia yeah. <laughs> yeah so yeah that sort of idea of um trying to get students working with data and in, every, in everyday thinking about economics. Yeah. Mm. And think about it like that. Okay. Any more thoughts? No, uh, we'll crack on, shall we, Dean? Yep. Go for it, Michael. So, 
we would be a poor session on <laughs> thinking about using economics to or teaching economics using data if we didn't start with data <laughs> and also plug the economics network to some extent as well mm. this is uh or is it a bar chart effectively showing um there is also one of the questions that the economics network poses to graduates or not to employers Later, of economics yeah. graduates and the question is effectively which of the skills do you see as important in economics graduate appointees to your organization and this is from the last one that was conducted in 2019 and um the sort of question that i would pose to my classes when i took that up is you know what sort of strikes you about mm. that uh, those findings and those results um well so you <laughs> pose the question but effectively what you might suggest is oh yeah we've come to the wrong session we should be looking at um abstraction or the communication of economic ideas <laughs> but effectively there are some very important skills that um, employers of economic graduates uh value mm -hmm. in their appointees and as i said, just abstraction analysis and communication of economic ideas but I suppose the one that we're focusing on and we think about is this one, which is the idea of um, organizing, interpreting, and presenting quantitative data, and how that is valued by employers very highly. And uh, as teachers and lecturers of applied economic subjects like myself, and mm. to some extent Dean, that um, yeah, we sort of think about that and think about the idea of organizing, interpreting, and presenting economic data. Mm. And the sort of thing you can do with students is to like, pose a question, using data and so say, well, they look at this data. What do you what do you get from this data? And use that the data as a starting point for the discussion of a topic. Mm -hmm. Um sort of think about it like that. Okay. And Dean, building bridges, horizontal connections. Yeah, um, I've got my colleague John Gaster to thank for these um, pictures of, of, of bridges. Um, I, I said earlier that, oh blimey, 20 years ago, probably a bit longer than that actually, um, I, I was working as a, a professional economist, a civil servant in the Treasury. God, that might have been an interesting place to have been working in recent weeks, I would guess. Um, and I, I'd, I'd been in academia before uh, lecturing, and then I uh, and then, then I returned uh, and joined Michael at, at Trent in God, what was it the mid two thousands, Michael? And one of the gaps that I noticed quite quite quickly was this employability or the academic economist versus um, the professional economist, and I was quite. Concerned, and I think I, you know, I don't want to suggest that it was immediately obvious. It was part of a journey that I went on, that there was this evident gap between the the skills and the the approach that we tend to take in our um, training of um, young economists at university, and the world in which professional economists in particular work. And I, I mean, I have to be quite blunt. I don't think that I felt that the training that I'd been given help to perhaps bridge that that gap between the world of you know being a student and developing as a, a young academic economist and the world of professional economics so one of the the bridges that um, I think we want to talk about today is how you can use data in a way that professional economists are regularly using data as michael suggested and that can be in many ways but if i give you a sense of what i was doing you know on a day-to-day -day basis working with data i was doing sort of what we horribly call briefing notes my students if they hear the phrase briefing notes again will probably go dean get out of here but that's essentially what we were doing we were you know it could be um, a data release from the office for national statistics on how um, well it would have been consumer confidence retail sales data from the halifax you know for me on how prices data from the Bank of England on lending and it was using data and I don't apologize for you and um, for using the following word for telling a story data is a very powerful way 
of getting students to tell an economics story. And that's often what an, a, an economist, a professional economist is doing. So that's certainly one of the things we want to talk about today. And Michael's going to give an example, aren't you, from the module that, that you teach, one of the modules you teach on how you try and bridge that, that gap and get them comfortable using data. So that's certainly one of the bridges. But one other bridge, and I can talk for England, so I promise, Michael, I won't talk too much. One of the other bridges is that data is a fantastic way, a fantastic medium, if that's the right word here, of transforming the student learning experience such that the real world becomes part of their their learning. Um, you sometimes hear this phrase, don't you, authentic learning, authentic assessment and I think it's authentic in two ways hence the two bridges it's authentic in that you're sort of bridging that gap between the world of the professional economist and our ac academic training but also you're bringing it bringing the real world into the the student's learning experience itself you're using data to motivate help to shine a light on issues raise their. I think the word you use when we met um, Michael a few weeks ago is it helps to raise their curiosity doesn't it piques their interest I think I'm nicking your phrase at that point aren't I so I ought to let you back in yeah well I think this is a key point is that the idea of you have that building bridges between what they do in class uh, in their student work and what they do in the world of work but also it's the idea of making students sort of like see the point of what they're doing and piquing their interest using data in a sort of way that we just did we, you're just trying to sort of like present some data to students sort of like pique their interest and say oh what's going on there why is that happening how can I explain that using economics so they sort of think about that and also the other building bridges that we unfortunately have to sort of think about is we want students to do things in class which are similar to what they do in the world of work but by yeah. the same token then we can get the students thinking about what they do in assessments which effectively reflects mm. what they do in the world of work and then you have that link between what to do in class what to do in assessments and then what to do in the world of work and so they're much more prepared, as Dean suggests, and much more aware of what mm -hmm. are the sort of things that they may do as a professional economist in the mm -hmm. world of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's those <laughs> sorts of things. I, I think if we follow on from that, I don't know if you can, shall I go next slide, please? Take us back to the Downing Street days of the, oh, yeah. <laughs> the pandemic. Downing Street days. <laughs> <laughs> You could be prime minister by the end of the day, Michael. Um, but um, um, the, the biggest employer um, of economists here in, in the UK is the, the Government Economic Service, the GES. And it's it's perhaps worth just spending, not, not too long, but a, a few minutes just outlining the sort of um, process that some of our students who who um, apply to join the GES, what they what they go through and what they're being assessed against. And then just a, a word about a document that the Government Economic Service has put forward in terms of the skills that it um, is looking for, is expecting, I guess is a more appropriate word here, of um, economists within the, the various government departments. Okay, and I think that's quite important because in bridging the gap, I think we often need a sort of easy way of thinking, right, well, what does the professional world, because you know, many of our colleagues, and it's not criticism, you know, go straight from an academic training, don't they, into, into their own research, into their own teaching. So it's nice if we have a sort of straight, um, a relatively straightforward <clears throat> framework that we're familiar with with that we can adopt and say to students actually this is what the world of professional economics looks like and you sort of get buy-in so at assessment centers that students who go on the fast stream uh, um, uh, way into the GS which thankfully although it's been poor so I'm pleased to say is being restarted again um, students are assessed against three principal competences. So this is the idea that we might have a, a competency framework that we can think about when we're designing our teaching and learning activities, when we're designing our assessment. And that essentially is right, as well as you know, having an awareness of relevant subject knowledge, concepts, um, techniques, bits of theory, whatever, that we can apply that 
methods, we can apply it to help shine a, shine a light on it. So the application of that knowledge and the key there as well is, is tools, which includes data analysis, the use of data. And Michael was quite right that in the previous chart, we could easily have motivated the session and done it on the, the importance of effective communication, because I think that bar was quite high, wasn't it, in the, the chart that we took from Cloder's report a couple of years ago, communication was, was yeah. certainly very important and not always a, a strategy. I think of, of economists. But interestingly, the GES um, earlier this year put together a document, as I said, which develops what I've just said that they're assessing um, applicants to the GES, but are, are basically giving um, us a, a way into thinking about, right, what, what do we want professional economists, what attributes, what, what competencies do we want to have? And you won't be surprised that they obviously refer to knowledge, application, and communication, but they draw out specifically the importance of working with data, being able to source data, being able to present, tell stories with the data. And I think that's incredibly important. Particularly, I think, if you are thinking of developing your, your module, sometimes the resistance you can face from students is, why should I bother? You know, why should I do this? This gives you a sense of buy-in that, hang on a minute, this is, this is what professional economists are doing. And here, here's the evidence that they, they are. Okay. So what we thought we'd do now is sort of look at the, look at the different dimensions through which you could do this. So, Dean, you're going to talk us through this framework. Yeah. Do you want to put the full, do a couple of clicks? Because I can't, I can't see the, ah, that's it. Oh, <laughs> as if by magic. Um, what I, what I love to, to do um, with data is, is essentially two things. And I'm, I'm doing this in, in my macro modules at all years. So first year, second year and final year. I'm, um, I'm teaching at all levels uh, this coming year. For me, it's incredibly important that um, in motivating, what was your phrase again? Peaking their interest, wasn't it, Michael? I'm going to yeah. borrow your phrase again, that you, you give students a sense of the issues, the phenomena that, you know, are are out there that are important that are happening because what i i don't want to be doing um i shouldn't need to i, I hope you'd all agree with macroeconomics at the moment i i shouldn't be sort of shying away from presenting them you know with evidence with with data on you know the very volatile macroeconomic environment and so this for example is a chart that i regularly put up across across all the years um but particularly with my finals year so what this chart is doing is trying to demonstrate to them the phenomenon that is credit cycles okay so what we've got here is the amount of what we call unsecured lending that's being extended by banks and building societies monetary financial institutions over a, a 12 month period net of any repayments okay and what you're hoping again taking on Board, you know, Michael's idea of motivating their interest, raising their curiosity, is to evidence quite, I think, quite significant. Because it's nice, it's nice when the chart is quite vivid, isn't it, Michael? When you know it sort of it hits you in in the face, to put it in a, a very uncultured, non-technical way. But it raises questions: Why are these credit flows so variable? Um, in their nature, what, what lies behind that. And it, it gives you a nice gateway, is that the word I'm looking for? A nice way into to thinking about the sort of theories and relevance that we have around credit cycles, whether it be things like the financial accelerator, which was sort of popularized by the likes of Ben Bernanke, who's just been awarded uh, jointly, hasn't he, the Nobel Prize in in economics. But it's a gateway. I think that's the phrase I would use is it's a gateway. It doesn't have to be about the financial accelerator. It can be a, more generally about sort of pro cyclical lending and whether that that um, destabilizes the macro economy. But it's a nice vehicle, a nice conduit into to sort of motivating their interest. What's going on here? Does it matter? Um, well, I think that's an important point, Dean, isn't it? That idea that, that you can use the data as a vehicle to get them interested in the economic underpinnings mm. that draws them in to the underlying economic explanations. 
Mm. And as I say, you you can use that in in various ways. The the underlying economics, you know, might be dependent on you know the module you're teaching. Um, etc but i mean i could imagine you know if i was doing a financial module i might want to look at issues around regulation around um, capital adequacy basel so sometimes data is is quite a useful way of exposing them to quite quite a lot of ideas isn't it it's a, it's a, as i say i'm going to use the phrase gateway yeah. you can do you can use data and a whole variety of different yeah. types of data and things mentioned finance which is my area and so there's lots of different types of data which you can use just to draw students in, get them interested. Um, he mentioned our capital ratios and mm. liquidity ratios in banks. You can just even look at a share price line, which um, I've done in the past. You just you do a draw, show a, show a share price over the course of a year. And you look for something as Dean says, something interesting. <laughs> uh, so a big drop in a share price can be a very interesting thing to try and explain. You say, why has that happened? What's that? No, what's happened there? You know, why has that happened? And then you start, then you can start just getting students interested in the okay, what is the explanation for why that share price has declined so much in that particular date mm -hmm. or over that yeah. period of time? So there's all sorts of things where you can just draw the students in using the, the data. Right. And so that's one aspect. I suppose the other aspect that we sort of think about is the idea of assessment. Mm. And so the one way in which you sort of like use data is to try and interest students. But another way in which you can do it is to try and engage students by making data and the sourcing mm. and analysis of data integral to what yeah. they're doing. So the idea of so what I, what I thought I'd present to you is sort of like two different types of assessment on a similar sort of topic. And effectively, the idea you could use assessment for, as a vehicle for deepening students' understanding of economics. Um, so this is a question that's quite dated now. I can see the question is quite dated. It's this is probably the last exam I ever set, which is 2014. <laughs> the like, last I exam I, ever, Michael. No, 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 I, I, I don't tend to use the, um, unseen examinations in assessments or assignments. So this is um, one I set for. This was an introductory finance for economists module. So there was a module which I taught many, well, for many years on you know introducing finance to undergraduate economists and first mm -hmm. years. And so this is a sort of classic examination question you might ask on. This is on debt markets government debt securities so you give them a bit of data this is taken from the financial times you ask them a few questions which is based around effectively knowledge and understanding and then you get them to apply some economic explanations to what they see in the data what they observe in the data and so you're trying to get them to apply the economic concepts in this case you're looking at opportunity cost and risk and sort of trying to apply the concepts of opportunity cost and risk to what the changes in the yields that they're observing from one week to the next. And then I like getting them to draw a demand supply diagram after that, just to get them to illustrate what is the market process through which the change happens, the change in price and hence the observed yield. So that's sort of question you could ask them in, a, in an examination setting, an unseen examination. Now, there, the students are quite passive. Mm. They're quite passive learners in that sort of environment, in that sort of sense. So what I thought I'd what I thought I'd do with that module and most of the modules I teach is effectively you, know, you, you change students from being passive to being more active learning. And effectively you can use assessments and database assessments as a vehicle for that learning. Because effectively you are empowering the students in some ways by making them think about data and sourcing data. So this is the equivalent. This is a few years later, the same module. Um, and the sort of like the, uh, the question on government debt instruments from a few years later. There's a few parts there which effectively are about demonstrating knowledge and understanding of aspects of the market. But really, from part three onwards, the sorts of things I'm looking for students to demonstrate are very similar to the sorts of things I'm expecting students to demonstrate in the unseen exam, but with a big difference. 
the students are going to have to go and look for the mm -hmm. data that they're going to use. And this is a very big Zian phrase um, uh, to demonstrate their learning. So effectively, they, they select the data that they're going to use to demonstrate learning. So you're giving them some control over what they're going to use to show how much they've learned and how much they know about economic explanations for uh, uh, for changes in yields. So you, you, you effectively give them that power and give them that ability. So effectively, you're getting them to use not just skills in terms of knowledge or, or demonstrating knowledge and understanding, you also get them to use those skills and data analysis mm. in what is effectively an introductory finance module. It's not in a stat statistics module. It's not an econometrics module. It is a finance module. And so you are changing that, the nature of the, the work that they do to, to have data integral to that. So that the data is integral to what they do in the classes. The sourcing of data is integral to what they do in the classes and it's integral to what they do in the assessment. And so that really gets them incentivized and engaged with, with the material. Mm. That's sort of the key aspect there. Yeah. So that's sort of the, the way I would look at it out like that. Any thoughts, Dean? Uh, I mean, what, what Michael and I, I, I think we were having a, a discussion about whether in fact the pandemic and the impact that it's had on assessment because you you're basically saying michael that you've moved largely away is that fair from your traditional exam to um to coursework and there must be and people can put this in the chat there must be um quite a few of us now who are using i i know the sort of generic term being used is time constrained assignments at aston we we've been calling them takeaway exams which is not the nicest term but sort of time constrained online exams where the exam would be available for a short period of time so the pandemic i think will have to use a horrible macroeconomics word will have a sort of scarring effect i think an enduring effect on on how we assess but in a way i think it has worked in certainly in my favor i feel and i, I don't know if others feel this too mm. in allowing us to if if we have got the, the sort of flexibility with these time constrained assignments, incorporating data within the assessment as part of what we're doing. And as you quite rightly say, Michael, aligning that with, with the activities, because all I was doing was putting up data in the classroom and then the students themselves never got the opportunity to, to go and get their hands dirty, become comfortable. And I'm glad, I think it was Julie agreed with me that, you know, overcome that word, that, that sort of phobia. I think assessment design, because we, we have institutional constraints, we have to recognize that. I mean, we were gonna have a discussion about the constraints in incorporating more widely the use of data in our activities you know whether it's taking students more regularly to computer labs or whether it's in the assessment regimes and the sort of tariffs that we have but i do think you know i hope i'm not going off on one here michael but i think the pandemic has opened up a little bit for for many as many of us the opportunity to to be a little bit more flexible in in how we assess but it's an important bridge isn't it that we wouldn't want to just be using data if we could avoid it just to motivate don't get me wrong that's an important part of what we do but we do want students to to be actively engaging with with that data are we at the point where we want well i think um, i think i'll just add add to that point is like yeah i think that, that, what, it's, it's um it's effectively that sort of idea as julian mentioned but and Hannah mentioned about phobia and students mm. not feeling confident in working with data. And what, we, what we're trying to overcome in these sort of situations is just thinking about how, how easy it is. It can't, not how easy, but how it doesn't have to be, you know, detailed analysis of data. It's effectively just being comfortable, just looking at some data, mm. maybe opening up an Excel spreadsheet, pulling down some data, and then just doing a bit of descriptive statistics uh, on, on that data in Excel, isn't it? That's a sort of idea. Mm, you mm. Can do it. I think in the pandemic, it was it was valuable in some senses because students got used to engaging with laptops yes, and, 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 or computers. And you could, I, I certainly 
was shared Excel spreadsheets with data yeah. and we could work with the students together mm. online on populating an Excel spreadsheet because you just share the spreadsheet with the whole group and everybody's working on the same spreadsheet. And so you learn to sort of be able to do that and share those experiences. Mm. I mean, one of the, just the one final thing from me, I think one of the biggest surprises to, to my students is when I say to them that data um, for telling economic stories is something that professional economists are often doing and they're looking at me because you know, I, I, I want them to be comfortable with using data in various ways. And that, you know, and that, that will for some of my colleagues mean that they're undertaking, you know, more econometric, more, more rigorous analysis. But equally, I want students to see data and its use is more than that, you know, <laughs> that we do use it in a, a variety of ways. And, and some, particularly for, you know, our younger students who are coming to, to university where I think that phobia is particularly severe, getting comfortable that you you can, you know, you can teach. And I would say to them like that, yeah, Excel, uh, something like Excel um, is particularly powerful. I, we have a lot of students because um, placements asked and are compulsory. Uh, and the biggest thing, and I think I mean, you've got quite a few too, haven't you, Michael? But whenever you go on placement visits, what's one of the things that they always say to you that they want their students to be um, proficient with um, it is the use of excel but things like snatter i've got a colleague um, a, a doing workshops uh, using r which i know the treasury uh, are using it but I, it's just increasing their awareness of what you can do with data that data isn't just econometrics but I, I, you know i'm not dissing econometrics because that's a powerful part of our discipline but data is is more than that and it's a you know it, it's not something that you need to be terribly frightened with um i think that's the key point i think we've got some comments in the chat which we, we could refer yeah, to here. Michael. So julie yeah. and dun lee have mentioned some interesting ones about um the teaching of these things mm. um julie mentioned about the idea of yeah i i agree with the idea that actually i think that the students that that we had were do quite like the idea of say coursework or time constrained assessment mm. the idea of a takeaway paper you know where, where you can give them the opportunity to go away and source data in that time constrained period mm. this, this, this should be enough time to do that mm. and excel yeah i tend to use excel yeah um, as a finance person um we, we're fortunate enough and i don't know i know not everybody's able to do this but you know I've, I've got access to bloomberg and our students have access to bloomberg and so we can source data using the Bloomberg software, and then that has got Excel add-ins. It's also got an API function as well. So some colleagues at Masters level use those sorts of functionality in it, with it as well. But yeah. I suppose, I suppose, Michael, I have this utopian view that all my first years in macro, by the end of their um, session with a uh, module with me, would be able to sort of know on the ONS site, you know, that real GDP is ABMI and, you know, the code and they could constantly work on updating, you know, charts and that sort of thing. So I think um, you know, that is the use of Excel becoming more confident that data can be used, as I say, for telling stories, for motivating questions, for motivating analysis. Um, I think it's a really powerful thing to do. Yeah. And as I say, just convincing students that data isn't frightening, it isn't just, you know, the, the more sort of uh, econometrics, which again, I, I'm not dismissing that, that's that's not the purpose here. Um, no. Do we do we want to give um, people an opportunity now, Michael, to, I know you were talking about Breakouts. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think now's the time to, I, I don't know if anybody's getting more comments or questions at the stage, but what we thought we'd do now is sort of put you in some breakout rooms of about, I don't know, well, four or five, same with the group that I was in as well, definitely. And yeah. lots of interesting ideas came out of it, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, perhaps to, to, to wrap up, um, um, do we do we want to um, perhaps open the floor to to the group and see if they've got any particular questions or perhaps any particular examples of things that they've found worked well, less well? Um, well, I think some I think some some of the, the people from the group I I most of them, but I, I listened more than I spoke in that group and I find it very interesting listening to some of the things and so um, some of the things around uh, some people were talking about the idea of storytelling. 
Yes. So using data for storytelling. So if someone, I think, was it Julie, um, highlighted the idea of storytelling. Yeah. Go on, Julie. I, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, hi, everyone, and especially hi. Ed Endido and Hannah. Hello, former Sussex people. Nice to see you on the screen. <laughs> Um, just very briefly, I've been, I, I run um, our final year dissertation module and I have done right. it for many, many years and um, lots of students, even though they've done a lot of quantitative modules, stats yeah. and econometrics by the time they get to the final year, you you start talking to them about data and you can see the panic on their face. Uh, okay. Um, and so the number of times I've had to sit down with a student with their Excel spreadsheet and say, this is how we're going to get into data. Yeah. And I run workshops on this as well, but you still have some students you have to hold their hand to do it with. Mm. But one of the thing, one of the things I was saying in our breakout room is that, and, and, and other people said that they have the same experience with their students, is that often students want to jump to the economic yeah. modeling without stepping back and and mm. just looking at what the data is telling them so yeah. mm. so i i was saying in our group that i quite often get students just to spend a couple of weeks just playing with the data i call it playing mm. and then i say you know that means drawing a graph yeah. describing you know looking at some summary statistics looking at the odd values that you see you know can someone really be 200 years old in your data set <laughs> what might be going on and and just getting them over that worry that by opening up the data that somehow they're going to ruin it in some way I think they're I think they are frightened about what to make of it and whether or not mm. they're going to damage it in some way by accident yeah. um and I and then I tell them that when they read really good articles you know in their, in their research papers that they're reading on on their other options often the ones that they most enjoy are the ones that start the paper with this is this is you know the motivation we see this yeah. really big thing in the data and this is what we're trying to explain and then they draw a graph or have a really good table that illustrates this is the problem we're trying to understand yeah you know yeah. why has this thing happened or whatever and i find that is quite a good way of getting out getting the get, getting past the phobia because students then see it as mm -hmm drawing a graph, interpreting a graph and thinking about what mm. it means. And then also linking that to critical reflection and things like that as well. Mm. Um, and, and after all that is, that's the really fun part of, of, our, of a lot of research actually is finding yeah. the first point for your question. Yes. Um, yeah. And then the econometrics usually just follows from that really, mm. certainly at mm. undergraduate level, obviously for PhD students, it's a different kind of thing, but we're, we're mostly talking about undergrads or maybe master's students. So that's what you're trying to do with them really. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I so think it's, yeah, I think it's, that's an important point, but I think the idea of if you can, and because I, I don't, I'm, I'm not an econometrician by any means. So in fact, when I'm teaching using data, I don't take them beyond descriptive statistics or drawing graphs or simple correlations. So I might show them econometric results as part of getting them to make sense of things that they're observing, but they won't be doing econometrics in my finance modules. But if they if they get more exposure to these sorts of descriptive statistics and yeah. you know, relationships in just the everyday thinking of economics mm -hmm. and wider economics, mm -hmm. then I think that can help them greatly to get mm. over that phobia mm. Mm. that's what i that's my belief is just 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 show them a bit of data and it'll be fine mm. i mean what i what i found really powerful from today is i've always been reluctant using the phrase storytelling i always thought it was a dean thing you know i always thought uh, i should be very reticent or shy um because maybe some of my colleagues let alone the students might think that i don't know that i'm almost dumbing economics down and uh, we're not are we <laughs> we're not doing that at all um so i'm 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 really pleased julie that you've confirmed that there is a there is a need to do this that this is a very powerful thing and you know even in our writing our own research we know that the, one of the most important things we need to do to lure someone into our work is to to motivate you know this is important because and data are a very very what's the word a very good way of doing that isn't there um i think we've got a comment there's a nice use of data in economic history uh okay with a with a link that's 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 yeah 
absolutely. So I think that's, I, I, I'm relieved to hear that, um, <laughs> Julie. I am, I am. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I've I've heard I've had pr professorial colleagues. Of, I'm not a professor. Um, I've heard professors of economics talk about what's the story you're trying to tell. With yeah. Media. So I think I think I think it is more widely accepted um, um, as a you know what are we trying to get at with with this research? So yeah. yeah. I'm going to throw this one at you, Michael. But Linda's asked because you, you you've got one where you've got students downloading and their own data sets, haven't you, Michael? Uh, and Linda's asking how that affects the marking load. Well, I'm going to say it actually, that actually the, the marking load, I, I, I don't teach big modules. So that the maximum we have in the modules that we teach and if Helen's still on a call, she'll probably tell me off now. <laughs> you know, when we went to the industry <laughs> finance module, we had about 200 doing that. And so what I tended to do, because it was shared out among four staff, it was, shared, it was shared out among four staff. And what we tended to do was I'd have, and this is another way in which you can avoid problems, because someone mentioned in the group I was in, um, right. about how do you know they've done it? How do you know that they've done the analysis? Or what I tend to do is I tend to have what are called interim de de data deadlines. Right. So we have to submit data that they're going to use periodically during the course of the module and that gets checked that and I effectively that creates that sort of incentive that if they're going to have to go and collect the data then they're going to that's the data that they're going to analyze yeah so you so can design that, the assessment in but a also, way that, yeah. but also I tend to go and screen I used to go and screen all of that submissions and effectively mm -hmm. I, I pre-prepare I never tend to pre-prepare comments because the same comments come up time and time again so if you pre-prepare comments that you think right. are going to come up then you can put those on a Word document, share them across all the people who are marking on the, the module, and then they just copy and paste those comments in relation to each response. And that saves a lot of writing and it saves a lot of, you know, having to rewrite things. So I, I feel the marking load is not that much greater. Marking an examination versus marking one of these assessments is not that more onerous. Okay. But of course, if you're if you got a module with as someone mentioned in my group, like they, they've now got to have massive expansion. We're all feeling this, aren't we? Mm -hmm. we're going up from 250 to 400, 500 students in a module, then yeah, that is a big expansion. And you may be very careful and you may be, th be thoughtful about oh, well, how am I going to grade this now? And how are we going to actually grade this in a manageable way? So mm -hmm. yeah, that's it does. I mean, you have to sort of think carefully about how you're going to grade things, how are you going to mark them? Mm. I'm mindful now that uh, it's three o'clock. I've I've actually got a lot out of the session myself, so I'm very grateful for everyone coming along this afternoon. A special thank you to to Michael and to Ashley, who's uh, working behind the scenes to make all this happen. So we, we ought to thank Ashley. Thank you, Ashley. Um, and I hope more generally ev everyone feels that they've got something out of it, that We've had a, an interesting conversation. Um, so, yeah, from me, thank you.